All right, welcome back. Episode 159 of Chaotically Intolerant. Uh, we are going uh, diving into baseball again today. Um, next week, we're going to cover the draft uh, just because when this release is going to be Thursday, we won't know what happens until Thursday night. And then this episode is pretty much outdated by <laughs> by Thursday night. So rather not have that happen. Um, so we're going to cover baseball and then we'll react to the draft next Thursday. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, uh, share, all that stuff. And let's go. All right. So. Baseball, what what's what's going on? I mean, the the umpires, it's getting crazy. This is getting ridiculous. This is um, the the scandals and and the issues just don't end with Major League Baseball this season. I, w- I was at the game Monday, um, the Yankees game when Aaron Boone got tossed, and I couldn't quite figure out what was going on um, from the upper deck. But um, a fan yelled something because um, you could see the replay that he didn't say anything. It didn't look like anyone else on the bench said anything. Uh, it was uh, one batter into the game, no less. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I, I like the minor league thing. They're doing the little challenge. It's like a five second thing. And you get, I don't know how many challenges you get that, that might be where we're headed. Uh, I, but I think it's, it's not even the whole balls and strikes or challenging the calls so much. What to me, the problem is, what you can review, what you can't review, for example, you know, I I understand not being able to review balls and strikes, but things like whether a ball was foul tipped. Remember we saw this in a a Yankees Astros ALCS game a few years back where it was clearly a swing and a miss and it was called a foul tip, things like that, that can really alter the course of the game. And, and baseball would be better served. Manfred is not going to do this because he's not that smart. But it'd be better. They'd be better served to be proactive about this stuff now because inevitably something weird is going to happen in a playoff game. It's going to come up. It's going to be at a critical point. There's going to be something that needs to be reviewed that they'll say, "Well, but it's not. It's supposedly not reviewable." You tell me. Wasn't there the Red Sox were playing the Rays in the playoffs and the guy like kicked the ball over the fence or something for a double? Hunter Renfro. Wasn't there a play against the Rays? Yeah, it was something weird. It was a uh, yeah. I I know what you're talking because I was at if it was in Tampa, I was at the I was at the game. What was it? Fenway. It was um. I had something to do the ball with, with the... the wall. Oh yeah, I I definitely remember this now. Yeah, this is a weird one. It was a ground rule double. Right. Right. It, I'm it, trying it, to find it, the actual it, video. Yeah, I'm looking at it now, and it 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 should have been a run. The Rays would have taken the lead in the 13th inning. And Renfro kicked it over the fence inadvertently, which made it a ground rule double, which meant the runner had to stay at third. Um, and the Rays did not take the lead. And I think Christian Vasquez hit a walk off homer in the bottom of that inning. Two run homer. Did. Uh, I'm watching it right now. So yeah, yeah, it just but bounced point, off his body. It hit his wall and yeah. bounced off his body. That's weird. Yeah, uh, apparently, I guess. Cash said they were able to challenge it and they didn't uh, and that they could not determine that it was intentional. Maybe it was maybe the issue there was not that it wasn't reviewable, but that it wasn't that that you can't determine intent versus not intent. So I I don't know. That just came to my mind because I was just thinking about weird calls that happen in the playoffs. But they need to get out ahead of this thing now. Yeah, I, I think I think the only reason that I understand that Aaron Boone got it is because. It's a little bit of the boy who cried wolf. I mean, Aaron Boone is is more than well known around the league for being a big crybaby, for constantly yelling. I think his his like ejections or uh, like average ejections in a season or something. It's like close to what Bobby Cox is at. Like I think Bobby Cox is at like twenty seven, and Aaron Boone is at like twenty five. So it's not exactly like this is just some random manager that that normally doesn't cause trouble and he gets thrown out. Like right. he got a warning in the first inning too, so it was like he's these are this this is the one time I'm like eh, I I get it you know I, I I understand an umpire making the mistake, but I never really understood why they can't challenge a foul ball like a a, a tip. I can understand balls and strikes because it is a, a judgment call, but a foul ball is just 
it either hits the bat or it doesn't. That's it. That's all that. It, that's all it is. I don't understand why they can't challenge that. Well, in that case, they were reviewing whether he was he had swung at a pitch that hit him, um, which is, I guess, again, also a judgment call. Though they'd almost be better served to come up with a laser that determines the swing than they would balls yeah. and strikes. Because I've seen a lot more if he calls on check swings, like the one that ended the Dodgers Giants postseason series in twenty one. Also, clearly not a swing. They called it a swing. Game over. That you wish you could at least review those or at critical mm-hmm. moments in the game. Do like the VAR system for for uh, soccer. Yeah, something like that. Which I, I don't like. I don't like bringing soccer into American sports. I don't like bringing anything they do here. But right um, no. Uh, but um, this is. I feel like this is just a complete missed opportunity on baseball's part. I mean, you have you're the biggest superstar in possibly the history of baseball right now, like the international superstar is playing on a super team that might tear through the playoffs. You have a team that lost a hundred games just a few years ago. Now they're like the world series favorite, at least the American league favorite. And you have, I mean, just constant negative headline after negative headline, these uniforms, um, Shohei's interpreter. Like what do we do? How is this? I mean, I feel like Rob Manfred should, there's plenty of times when Rob Manfred should be fired, but this is the perfect season to grow the game. It feels like, you know, and, and the game is speeding up. The the pitch clock is, is an awesome thing. This was a perfect opportunity to grow the game of baseball, and they're squandering it. This is a – who would want to watch baseball right now? I don't know. I don't know that that many people are. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's – I think, I think the attendance record – they're at least they're doing really well with attendance. Like April was, has been one of the best months for baseball attendance, at least in this month, but still it's embarrassing. I mean, what there, there are three other major American sports right now that do pretty much everything better. Like say what you want about the NBA, but they're not having these scandals right now the, maybe their uniforms suck. The <laughs> one, uh, they did just ban a, a gambler as well. Um, What's it? I don't even remember his name. He played for the Raptors. He was some tenth man, whatever. Which again, I don't. I don't understand. I don't understand whatsoever. If you are a professional athlete, that is the cardinal sin. The one thing that can one hundred percent get you banned for life: gambling, and you still do it. Right, You're making millions of dollars. It makes zero sense to me whatsoever. Why anyone would be that stupid? I don't get it. You're holding the lottery well, ticket. You have the winning lottery ticket, and you just gave it away. You just handed it off to some homeless man on the street. That's what you did. Um, but I, I don't understand why anyone would want to watch baseball at this moment. This is, I mean, you have hockey. I think hockey just had, like, one of the greatest finishes of all time to end the regular season. And then I know Maple Leafs and Bruins game was a really good ending, too. Like, they ran a post pattern with Austin Matthews to score a late goal. So, yeah, it's, yeah, this is embarrassing. An embarrassing. This is the time of year where baseball definitely gets dwarfed. You had March Madness finishing up the first week of the season, and then you had, um, you know, obviously NBA, NHL playoffs kicking off right now, and um, and then football will take over in September. And people are way more into mid regular season football than they are baseball postseason. It's just a yeah. sad reality. People are more into the NFL draft than they are into baseball right now. Yeah, I think that's probably true also. And you also, the other the other big point is you have Mike Trout, who's like returning to form. We're, we're finally getting to see a healthy, dominant Mike Trout. Like, I think, I think he is the most underrated superstar the game has had just because of his injuries. And I think even just playing in the little brother of Los Angeles, you know, you're mm-hmm. in Anaheim, that it's a weird little place, you know, outside of LA I re- this is just a so many opportunities to really grow this game like this is like the biggest opportunity for them this year and they are just completely completely squandering um yeah I'm also looking angel or Orioles angels tickets are as low as two dollars <laughs> for, for tonight's game or today's game at 407 that's just hilarious um, yeah because ESPN does the tickets I mean, nobody goes to Angels games, especially middle of the week. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's let's go down the list here. So, who are the two teams that you were uh, 
happy with, I guess, the two winners um, from the last week. From the last week, I mean, Cleveland continues to just impress early on. I would say Cleveland to me is the big, big story right now. 17 wins with the new manager. Um, they lose their ace, Shane Bieber. Um, I always like Stephen Vogt as a player, and he's he seems like he'd be a great player's manager the way that Terry Francona was, I think. They got a lot of energy with Josh Naylor, headbutting guys. Um, yeah, I, I have questions whether they can sustain scoring a lot of runs the way their offense is built. But, mm -hmm. again, you don't have to be that stellar to win the Central, though it's an improved division. Detroit's playing well. Kansas City's hanging in there. Um, Minnesota, not off to a good start, but they're – they, you know, with Royce Lewis, Carlos Correa out, there'd be hope for when those guys return. Um, I would say, so you said two winners? Yeah. I, I, I would say that the continued uh, emergence of the Brewers. I mean, dropped a couple to Pittsburgh, but played really well on the road thus far. Uh, you know, they got their young stud, Jackson Churio. They did just put Wade Miley on the DL, and they, I, I, I still say DL. And, um, Obviously, they lost Corbin Burns, and they're waiting on Devin Williams to come back. If they can uh, kind of tread water, again, Central Divisions, who knows? So I've been impressed with those two teams. How about you? I mean, Cleveland, I think, is their, they're the hottest team in, in the American League at this moment. So I would just say them. Um, and then, really not sure. I mean, Philly's playing really good ball lately. You know, mm -hmm. they're eight and two in their last 10. And I think Atlanta is a little bit more expected to be this good. Um, although somebody somebody posted on a greatest moments of uh, Braves baseball, you know, they said the entire franchise of Atlanta is mid, which is just un completely untrue. That's good. That's a crazy thing to say. I was like, do you not know? And they had a, a Cleveland Guardians profile picture as well. So I was like, that's just crazy. People are insane. Um I'll go Philly. I'll give it to Philly here. Um, I so want to give it to the Mets, but they've lost three in a row coming into today. So, and I, I love giving it to the Mets, but um, I'll go Philly and uh, Cleveland. And then uh, what are two losers? Yeah, by the way, yeah, Philly, think about the rotation with um, Ranger Suarez pitching just dominant ball. And then Zach Wheeler, of course, Aaron Nola. So they figure out their bullpen. To be uh, certainly make another deep run. Um, two losers. Oof. Uh, I would say the Astros, absolutely number one. I think with all the – they're just decimated by pitching injuries now. Javier's on the IL. Brought Verlander back, but, you know, there are, now they're without Valdez. They're without McCullers, Garcia, or Keedy. I mean, and then the guys in there have not performed. Hunter Brown's had a dreadful start. I mean, Presley and Hayter have really struggled. And Abreu struggled, I think, the first week. I mean – we're not used to seeing, you know, we've seen the Astros get off to kind of like average starts in some of these great years, but not, not like this, not seven and 17. It's, you know, the offense is still pretty good, but again, when the feeling is you have to score six, seven runs a night, it's just not sustainable, even as good as that lineup can be. And um, so I, I, it's shocking to see them behind even the athletics and the angels right now, even, even though we're still, you know, a week from May, um, I think you got to put the Astros at the top of that loser list for now, which I know makes a lot of people happy uh, to see uh, that the Astros are scuffling. Well, I, if I could give it to a player, I don't know if I can give it to a player, um, but I would give it to Blake Snell being my second one because he just went on the IL with an adductor strain and he has had a miserable start to the year. He was a loser in free agency waiting all the way to the end. I know he got money, but he, it, it Took him a while. He's never quite gotten comfortable, and now he's on the injured list, and we don't know how long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of pitchers that I guess I, I always equate him and, like, Trevor Bauer together. Bauer, I guess, had a really horrible start in the Mexican League, and then he just was dominant in his last start. So I, I figured that would be a little mentioning. I, I don't even know. I don't even know what the state of him is right I now. Don't. I mean – I have no clue because apparently there's another accuser coming out now. And then another one just got sued for defamation from someone else or something like that. I, I have no clue. Um, I'm going to go with my loser. I'm going to go with the Tampa Bay Rays. I despise Rays fans because whenever I hear them talk about baseball, I just point to the lack of trophies in your, in your trophy case there. Uh, but uh, they, they always talk like they are such hot shit. And, I think even coming into this year, they were like, 
it is, it's the same thing every year. Um, you know, we're, we're always doubted, blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, you guys are rightfully doubted. I would say, um, they've lost three in a row now and, uh, they have now dropped below the Red Sox who have a winning record. Um, which I think who is the most, I think the AL East is once again, the best division in the American league, at least. Oh yeah. By far. I think. Oh, by far in baseball. Um, Definitely, you know, four teams with a winning record and the Rays are one game away from winning from a winning record. But I'm giving it to the Rays in the American League and the National League. I mean, again, I, I don't want to give it to the Rockies again because they're just so bad. Hey, they have a W in the in the they have a win in their streak, so that's good. I'll give it to Miami. Um, I still don't really know what's going on with Miami. I don't know why they're so horrendous. I guess like I, I didn't expect this at all. I really didn't. And they are just, they're one of the most pathetic franchises ever since they switched from Florida to Miami. Yeah. They, the Marlins coming off a playoff year, you just wonder if the feeling was like, well, we bought ourselves, uh, you know, another 10 years since that's about how often we make the playoffs. I mean, again, they, they much like the Astros dealing with just a slew of pitching injuries um, in the starting rotation, you know, obviously losing, Sandy Alcantara and, uh, you know, Yuri Perez. It's just, I don't know. And then they didn't do much in free agency. They were linked at one point to J.D. Martinez, who obviously hasn't even taken the field. They lose Soler. They brought in, like, Tim Anderson, who won a batting title, what, five years ago? And uh, yeah, when, he got, when he got punched, I, I can't remember whatever the fight it was, when he got knocked out, that was the end of his career, basically, like, right there. Kind of feels like that could be true, yeah. And and uh, Skip Schumacher, uh, you know, he wasn't happy that they let Kim Ng go, so he uh, they changed his contract to where he has an opt out after this year. I think he's going to be out of his contract this year. And this was a guy who just won Manager of the Year. And I mean, think about the Marlins going back to what was it, oh six? I think Girardi was Manager of the Year. People forget Joe Girardi managed the Marlins before he managed yeah. the Yankees to a World Series win. And he got fired, I think. I won't swear to that. I mean, it was either a year, the year or the year after winning manager of the year with the Marlins. So that is a franchise that is just, um, uh, yeah, I mean, just used to bungling things at, in the most extreme way. Uh, okay, yeah, he was fired after he won manager of the year in 06. Like, that year, like he wins manager of the year and then they fired him. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Despite That's crazy. Trying, he was rewarded for his achievements with the Marlins in 06 with the National League Manager of the Year Award. That's crazy. Yeah. That's <laughs> Loria. I mean, just a just a joke of an owner. Um, that franchise has just uh yeah. I mean at the Seems like on paper, Miami, I mean, and baseball is a great marriage, right? Miami's a hotbed for baseball activity. A lot of great players come from that area, both high school, collegiate. Um, and the Major League franchise, you know, yeah, they had two nice World Series runs, 97 and 03, but they have, that's that's it. And I know that's big. That's still pretty a big deal because there's a lot of franchises that don't have multiple World Series wins in that in that. Uh, time frame like the Dodgers, for example, I just felt like pointing that out. But as just as far as management and as far as sustained success, there has been none. They what would we say they've made four postseason appearances. One was during a shortened year. So three full season playoff appearances in their history. Um, happened to capitalize so, on a couple. Does it have to do with the uniforms with the change? Because I we did I did a tier list on the last episode of MLB uniforms and I absolutely despise the current the current uniform. Oh, I hate the Marlins uniforms. I hate the whole Miami thing. I loved when they were the Florida Marlins. They're yeah. playing at the old pro player, Joe Robbie, Landshark, whatever Sun I don't know what else they called it. Sun Life. So um, they sold they sold everything. Yeah. Um you know, they were and again, I mean winning a fra winning a World Series in year 5 of the franchise is always brings you some goodwill even though they tore it all down the next year and um I don't know if it's the uniforms. I, you and I talk a lot about the dolphins being very soft and, and is it, you know, does where you play, does a lack of accountability from fan base and media equate maybe to not having a certain level of success? I mean, you could, there are definitely uh, 
use cases for teams like that, like the Dolphins, for example. But then there's, you know, teams like maybe the Maple Leafs in hockey, who yeah. the fans are starved for a championship since 1967 and have continually fallen short. Although we'll see, maybe this year will be different. Who knows? But um, nope, <laughs> not probably this not. Year. They're gonna fall probably short not again. You know, they they broke their little curse last year by beating uh, Tampa and then lost in five to Florida. But anyway, with the Marlins, I think. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, in the fan, there's just not an abundance of Marlin support. There just never has been, even during those World Series runs. They, uh, I, I, I really do think they're cursed, just because of that whole. I mean, even the stadium. Like, I, I feel like when they rebranded the Marlins, they rebranded. You know, like they built the stadium around the rebrand, and the stadium. I think a lot of people agree is just horrible. I who who would ever want to win? Like, how could you go into Miami and and think wow we're actually gonna win with these chicken shit you know of course there'll, there'll be free agents who are saying well so I'm gonna play for the blank athletics and I'm gonna be playing in a state-of-the-art minor league facility for the next three years great sign me up so basically it's, it's intimate it's intimate it's intimate <laughs> yeah basically and, and then nobody ever seems to want to sign with the Marlins so what is this now a 28 team free agency pool every year yeah. for players I mean, it's yeah. uh, it's a shame. I mean, look, in a perfect world, and we are so far from that, but in an ideal world for sports, you know, the league would own all the teams. There would be no owner. It would just be GMs doing having a set amount of money to work with and yeah. doing everything they can to make the team better, given the same constraints as every other team. And you wouldn't have one owner saying, yeah, but I don't care about winning. I just want to break even. And then another owner is like, no, 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 no I, I, I want to win. And then it's like, well, what fun is that? So then what are the A's? I mean, they're just fodder so that the Dodgers and that the Yankees can fatten up, you know, and win and win championships. So that's the that's the ugly side of professional sports. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the Orioles. Okay. Is, is uh, Jackson Holiday a bust? <laughs> it's not a bust. And it's certainly not yet. I, I just – I'm shocked that they – risked his service time i thought him and being the minors the whole deal was bring him up may 1st so he gets an extra year but they get an extra year of service time and then they ruin that and he is has i don't want to say he's embarrassed himself but he's looked embarrassingly bad and he's 20 years old can't even go into a bar and order alcohol you know you know, I know people say, well, you know, Juan Soto was doing that for the net it's not everybody's the same i know andrew jones in the 90s the braves it's it's rare when that happens, you know, and those guys, in fairness, I mean, Soto to a degree, yes, but did not come with the hype that Jackson Holiday has come with. I mean, there is a lot of hype around this kid, and you still have to remember he's 20. And so that level of pressure on him, um, it, I know sometimes teams catch their rookies catch lightning in a bottle. Look at Evan Carter last year for the Rangers. He was huge in the postseason. He's only 21, I think. And, um, and now he's an everyday player. But Holiday needs time and he needs time in the minors. He needs to go back to the minors, relax. When he comes back, he's not chasing his first hit. He's not making his debut. He's just coming back and playing ball. And I think he can kind of ease himself in. I think right now it's just, it's too much and they don't need him. Right. I mean, I say they don't need him, but they're 15 and eight without him, 15 and nine, whatever. And, and they have other guys carrying the load right now. I'm sure they could do without a 059 batting average right now. Who? Yeah. Who? Yeah. I mean, who couldn't? Like, yeah. I, I guarantee you, they could do without that. Um, and then another uh, debut. Jack Leiter made his debut, which he was the 2021, like second pick. Is that right? Second, uh, he. Pick? Yeah, I think the second pick. Uh, let's see. By the way, I did not realize that Holiday actually has two hits this year. I thought he had one. Forgot that he had picked up a second hit. <laughs> oh, it was last night he got a hit. Okay. He was uh, second overall in 2021. Yeah, the Rangers chose him. Because I remember the Red Sox were, were looking at him as well. They had like the fourth pick that year. Um, I remember him coming out of Vandy. And they were talking about this kid like he was... You know, some some he was going to be the next Nolan Ryan, the next Randy Johnson, or what you know, whatever. And uh, 
he got hurt, and then I honestly forgot he even existed until until he, he you know they announced his debut. I was like, this guy's still playing ball. I thought I I figured he'd be working at a dealership right now, like using his you know working in van like right next to Vanderbilt selling Chevys. But he I, he struggled, I guess. I actually didn't even watch his uh, his debut. Yeah, he, it was a rough one against Detroit. But look, pitching. I mean, that's the crazy thing. Baseball, it's not quite like football where you feel like a quarterback especially has to play well in the first couple of years or he really will be a bust. Baseball guys can emerge late in their career. I mean, heck, we're talking about the Orioles. I love this, uh, this you know, Albert Suarez story for the Orioles. Um, he's 34, throwing harder than he ever has in his life. He might stick around and be a part of the rotation all year. I mean, even while they're waiting for Kyle Bradish to come back, um, Rosenthal just did a story on Suarez and the athletic. Uh, yeah. I mean, 204 days between major league appearances when he made his Orioles debut this year. Uh, and he just, yeah. It, it, so it's, you just don't know guys can really have rebirths late in their career. They can, it can take them years. They can just have those one. I mean, the, I, you, I know you love the 2013 Red Sox. I mean, wasn't that the ultimate, like every guy had their one shining moment season the Daniel Navas and Will Middlebrooks and Johnny Go. I mean they all, you know the guys some guys that had solid careers but they all had basically career years then and I mean my I think like Mike Napoli like obviously Mike Napoli had a great career but that was his that was probably his best his most impactful year you would yeah. say I mean he swung that bat I I never forget his swing because it literally looks like in like you know caveman times he's swinging a, a club just like right. a big club it i love that i don't know why i don't know how he does it he just has a a larger barrel at the end i have no clue but however he did that i felt like he was going to hit a home run every single at bat that season yeah and a lot Even of teams guys didn't... like jared saltalamacchia mm -hmm. was was big like he obviously hit the walk off in game three against detroit or game two against detroit um and you even have, I mean, Poppy, like his, 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 his postseason that season was like God form. He, he just, no, he was unstoppable during the postseason. Obviously it was David Ortiz, but um, yeah, that was that 2013 team. Like you could point to every single guy and be like, what, what the fuck did he do? Like besides 2013, he didn't really do that much. Right. And a lot of teams, I think, shied away from signing Mike Napoli because I think he had a, a hip issue and a lot of teams in the Red Sox took a chance on him and everything just came together right worst to first to worst and that I think that happens in baseball more than we probably realize I mean it feels like there's always an onslaught every offseason teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees and the Mets you know throwing stupid money at big name players stealing the headlines putting together these so-called super teams and and it's frustrating but then the season plays out and you look at just some of these young teams and and then we blink and it's like the guardians are 17 and six and you know the reds are pretty good right I and mean, um the brewers are hanging i mean we don't know that if those teams will sustain or not necessarily but um you know you have teams that are that build from the ground up like the orioles which is is beautiful and as much as we hate them the astros did the same thing and the phillies right and the phillies we kind of lose sight of them as a big spending team and they have some big name free agents on their team right harper and turner and um, Castellanos and even a guy like Zach Wheeler, but you know, they went through a long period between 12 and 21. They had a, an entire decade where they didn't make the postseason once. Yeah. And now they're built for, I think, long-term success. So, I mean, I think it's good for baseball. It's good to have that. I, I, I really wish that you could curb what like the Dodgers did this off season a little bit and, and make some of these other teams spend and try to get these guys, but only so much you can do. Yeah. Um, you have the Oakland A's literally living out major, like the plot of major league, which I, I watched like last out, week. Like living out of a van. It's like, they're, they're like a nomad. They're not a, they're like a traveling, like, you know, have Jersey, have bat, will travel kind of team. We'll just, <laughs> Sure, we'll just show up. Just tell us where to be. You know, we'll, we'll sure we'll play baseball. Oh, the the Guardians need an opponent on Thursday, April twenty seventh. Sure, yeah, sign us up. We'll be there. Yeah, um, and then I guess we can talk a little bit about Paul Skeen. So he's looked he's looked great. He has a zero ERA in the minors, but they just have not let him go. 
Like they have not let him go. I think more than like four innings. I want to say. I mean, it's when they brought him to Bradenton, they advertised that they jacked the ticket prices up, and then he pitched two innings, and people were like, "Oh, well, you know, you have to expect it." It was like, don't don't advertise it. Don't act like it's like the coming of Jesus to to Bradenton, and then you throw him two innings. It's yeah, you wonder, and it just almost feels like it's guaranteed that he'll get hurt at some point. Because I think was it you said you were telling me that Pedro was talking about the way these guys or someone was yeah. telling me Pedro, you know, stretching your ligaments and and actually training yourself to pitch longer innings instead of being babied and no 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 pitch count pitch count. No wonder these guys can't go deeper into games. I mean, wouldn't you rather develop them to pitch? a little more and maybe a slightly shorter span in their career than give them, give glimpses of them over a longer stretch, which still doesn't guarantee that they won't get hurt. You know, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe someone should do some research why these guys 50 years ago could pitch. Is it just because they didn't throw as hard or is it because they train differently and everyone talks about well, technology and there's all these, these training methods now, how good can that be if guys are, yeah, they're maybe they're throwing harder than ever, but they're also getting hurt more than ever. So maybe we should look at that instead of just saying, oh, it's the pitch clock. Nope, it's, you know, just blame it on one thing or another. Oh, it's because they're throwing harder. Yeah, it's – I don't I don't think it's the pitch clock because I think even before they were having – I mean, Tommy John was a much bigger issue. Um, so I – and you ask any pitcher, they they say, listen, it's, it's how they're developing these guys. I want to say – I saw someone say, like, Tim Lincecum is responsible for this. Because when he was coming up, you look at his mechanics, he's rearing back as, as far as you possibly can. And he's, you know, he, I mean, Lincecum wasn't, wasn't throwing it slow. Like he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't a bum out there and he wasn't just a, a good, a good placement pitcher. Like he, his run was dominant, even though it didn't last very long. Yeah. Like I, Paul Skeen's also just like, it feels like, he just feels like one of those guys that's just going to be a what if, like, what if he stayed healthy? Kind of like Tyler Glasnow. In my opinion, like you, you always think, what if Glasnow stayed healthy throughout that early portion of his career? What do the Rays do? Do they are they able to keep him? Like, do they? Obviously, I think if he stayed healthy, you would keep him. Um, and you look at how these guys. I think if so I saw a side by side with Nolan Ryan and someone else, and they're not getting like flat. Like Nolan Ryan doesn't get flat. He's he's very high with the baseball versus these guys are much more out to the side. Like it's, they're much lower. They're trying to get more of that arm angle when Nolan Ryan was up here and he was kind of launching it like that versus these guys are flexing that elbow as much as possible. And again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, <laughs> not a doctor over here, but you know, it, there's something to that where you're it's, this doesn't feel normal. When I push my arm back, when I hold my arm out here, I can't even push my elbow back like that. I can't do that. That does not feel natural. Up here, it's a little bit more natural. It's still not supernatural. I mean, they say the most natural is sidearm, right? Or like all the way, submarine, basically, which is awesome, but not too many guys are doing that. Yeah, it's it's just, I don't I don't understand. I, I really think it's it's about endurance and stamina too. And just teaching these guys to just training him to go deeper. Maybe they do have to take a mile an hour or two off their fastball. I mean, who's to say that just because a, a guy who can throw 97 chooses to throw 95, there are guys who can get it done with 90 or 91. I mean, there is an art form to pitching that people forget about. I mean, right. Uh, was it last night? I think Max Fried threw a quote unquote Maddox. And I just bring that up because I always think of Greg Maddox when I think of what, what a pitcher is. We talked about Glavin last week or week before, whenever that was. And it was just a guy that could, he was just a, he was an artist. He would just paint corners mm -hmm. and it was beautiful. And I'm not saying that, that, you know, obviously it's hard to do that. And if guys could do that, they would, but you just wonder if guys can make their careers longer just by a slight mechanical adjustment or a slight change in velocity while developing other pitches, whatever the case may be. I don't know, but I think that if you're, coaching young players, you're teaching them how to pitch, you're pitching coach now with pros. I, I think you need to look a little deeper at some of the methods of how these guys are being prepped to pitch. Even even when I was a kid, they wouldn't let us throw curveballs because mm. they said it was horrible for your for your ligaments. Like it'll yeah. you know, it'll hurt. They said they'll like throw you out of the game if you try and throw a curveball if you're pitching. 
Yeah. Tanner Houck. He did finish his complete game shutout Wednesday night. And the Red Sox treated it like it was like a perfect game. They were like, where is this? <laughs> they were like, he's going to Disney World after this. Like he just threw, he threw a complete game shutout. It's like, why is that such a big deal to go nine innings? Like, obviously it's impressive. It's not something to just scoff at. But thinking of a guy going nine innings at all now doesn't matter. Or go Even going eight or seven is like almost a foreign thought to me. This is insane that you can't let these guys go. I mean, I was shocked that they let how go, no matter what his pitch count was. It's like they're they're really letting him go this long. Like they they're afraid to let anyone go that. Long. Yeah, I mean, who's to say that every guy that comes out of a game in the seventh or eighth inning is truly tired just because their pitch count is high? Sometimes guys feel great and they could still keep going, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes maybe they even say, "Hey, I'm I'm done," or they know that it's time to come out. But there's no there's no law that says that 100 pitches or this many innings, seven innings is automatically you can't go past that. Like, of course not. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's just you feel good or sometimes it's just your night. Um, so how? Yeah, that was a brilliant outing. Uh, Freed last night saw Ranger Suarez had a shutout. Those are the three that come to mind. I don't know if there's been any other complete games, but it's a big deal now. Yeah. Guys going complete. like Roy Halladay used to do that. Go complete games all the time. And I'm thinking. I'm trying to find, you know, think of someone in more modern times that was like, would go the distance. Like Mark Burley had quite a few and his games would always be fast because he would just get the ball and he would, he was the pitch clock before the pitch clock existed. Um, and, it, and it's, and, and remember Burley in particular, he didn't throw hard. He didn't throw hard at all. He was yeah. the, the art of a, just pitching. He it was beautiful. And he had, I think he had, well, I know he had one perfect game. He had maybe a two. In his career, I know he had one. I remember he had one where the Dwayne Wise had the crazy catch at the wall against the Rays, and I, I he may have even had uh, another no hitter. I gotta look it up. Um, I think yeah. he only had one. He only had one. Well, he had a perfect game. Yeah, one perfect game, one no hitter. So two no hitters. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So within in in oh seven he threw a no hitter, in oh nine he threw a perfect game. So. Again, uh, of course, we just saw Kyle Hendricks go to the the injured list, but he's another guy, and he's really struggled this year, really the last few years. But his prime years, he was very comparable to Greg Maddox, I think. And then I just, um, I, I, I just would love to see more pitchers like that. I just, I just hope that we can trend in that direction and not just – but it's so hard to just ignore a guy that throws 99 and, you know – Right or, or or can throw crazy nasty pitches, but I I I hope we see more you know renaissance of the Mark Burleys and Greg Maddox types in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and then I don't know if we've really discussed this. The White Sox are threatening to move, right? Isn't isn't that something? Are um, they? I want to say they're th- they're trying to get out of there. Whoops, I just got a little animation. Um, the White Sox are threatening to move. The Royals are threatening to move because they're not getting public funding for their new stadium or renovate. I think new stadium because the chiefs want to do renovations. And then um, someone else was threatening it as well. I mean, uh, Oakland, obviously they're moving. That's, that's a, that's a guaranteed thing. I can't remember who else. I think St. Louis wants a new stadium as well. Um, Where would be some of the ideal locations? If let's say these teams do move, which they're probably, most of them probably aren't. But where would you want to see some new teams? Oh, good question. Well, the Coyotes are moving to Utah, right? We're talking about yeah. that. But I saw Lake City would kind of be cool to have a baseball team. I mean, I think uh, I don't think you could go wrong with maybe like San Antonio, New Orleans. Of course, you'd probably have to have a dome because of the the heat down there in the summer. Uh, Charlotte, though, I mean, Charlotte's got what they have minor league baseball. Yeah. Um, the Carolinas don't have baseball. They don't pro they don't, neither Carolina has a professional baseball team. We've got, you know, the Panthers, you got the Hurricanes, you got the Bobcats, uh, the Bobcats, the Hornets. You had the Bobcats. Um, uh, you know, obviously great college, you know, gamut of college teams. I think if I could choose, I actually, I think I'd, I would choose either Charlotte or Salt Lake City would be my two choices. If we're going East West anyway. Yeah, there's there's so there's a big part of the map 
that just does not have baseball. Like, if you mm. look, I think it's just past Illinois all the way basically to, like, Arizona, wherever wherever the Diamondbacks play. I still can't remember. Um, Phoenix, there's, like, a yeah. whole area where there's no baseball whatsoever. I would love to see something like that. Like, let me just – or, uh, yeah. What about, like, international? Because I was thinking, why not – I mean, they're already in Canada – why not go down to like Mexico city just as a, you know, no one ever talks about putting a team in Mexico and baseball is massive for Spanish speaking markets. Well, they're, they're playing uh, the Astros and Rockies are playing in Mexico city this weekend. Funny. You should mention that. I think they have a two game set. I think they've been doing one of those every year. Um, it was the altitude. So for the Rockies, it's probably, you know, it's feel right at home playing in the altitude. It's home, yeah, it's a home game. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, right. Well, Puerto Rico. I mean, I think the what was it? The Expos back in '04 had a stretch where they played like twenty something games in Puerto Rico, which of of course is you know it's American territory. It's a hotbed. You know, a lot of bit great ball players come from there. I mean, I think that would be cool mm-hmm. to have a team there. I still would love to see Montreal or even like Vancouver get a team you could have like the nl version of the mariners you know like you have seattle and the al west and you could stick a vancouver team. you know move the well i hate to move the rockies because i still love their branding but you know i don't know the padres really would ever move or the or the diamondbacks would ever move you could put them up in vancouver i think i think you can move so I'm i'm also looking at teams that you could move um because maybe they just don't fit the white Sox, i think are at the top of the list of teams yeah you could move and a lot of people really wouldn't care. Like, cause you have the cuffs, I, the, the only two, the two city or the two team city is New York. I feel like you can't move the Mets. Like the Mets name is the Metropolitans first. You can't move them They're They are super important to the city. Um, I feel like, I mean, I hate that- to say it, you could move the Rays or the Marlins. You could, yeah. We we didn't mention Nashville as a possibility too, by the way. Um I think the Nashville's Rays getting Marlins. I'm hearing too much about Nashville. I don't want to hear any more about Nashville. They have the Titans, they have the Predators. I think they're okay. Like they don't seem like a basketball city. I feel like baseball I mean, really they, doesn't fit there. Well, it, it, the NBA has a team in the state of Tennessee at least, so you're right. So at least that state is represented with Everyone except, you know, every sport except baseball. And, of course, again, another great college sports state. Yeah. Uh, you could probably move. I mean, I would hate to see the Royals move just because I like the fountains of Kauffman Stadium. I, I've almost wondered if you could move the Angels again. I mean, the, the yeah. L.A. Angels of Anaheim. And, again, they don't get the attendance. They, It's just they couldn't get it. If When they had Otani and Trout, I mean, they couldn't draw and they couldn't win. I think sometimes – Moving cities just to shake things up, I mean, I think would be – it just – they don't feel like – I mean, when they were the Anaheim Angels, they had more identity. But they're just kind of stuck out there in Orange County, which is a lovely place. A lot of cool things in Orange County. But it just doesn't feel like a like a true baseball town, city, Anaheim. Or, so I think the Angels could move. Yeah. Um, I'm looking – like again, you can move the Rays or the Marlins. I think I think you can move both. I mean, as a as someone who lives in Florida, I want to be able to watch the Red Sox in person. So just don't move the Rays. I really think they should move the Marlins, though. What mm-hmm. there's we talked about it earlier. There's there's no purpose. Like it doesn't really feel like they have any sort of purpose there. I think plenty of other cities and states could appreciate that franchise more than what Miami is. I mean. Florida, you could say they already have too many sports teams anyways. I mean, they have three football teams, one basketball team. Is that right? Yeah, one one basketball team, two hockey teams. You have two baseball teams. Like, you could definitely get rid of the Marlins, and nobody would even notice. The Rays, I think, are a little bit more integral to the to the state. I don't know why, but they just feel a little bit – I think maybe they've just been more successful over the past, you know, over their entire franchise. I'm like, I want to try and break up like the Northeast because you look at the map, there's like tons of teams in the Northeast. At the same time, it's like you can't move those teams. The Nationals are the one team you could move. And I think people would be. They have moved. Okay. 
They could, yeah, they've already moved. Yeah. I think you could move them again, especially because Baltimore is also right there. You have the Orioles. Yeah, that whole right massive there. dispute. And I can tell you, having lived in D.C., it's it's not. I mean, yeah, people are into it. They go, but it's it's a lot more of a passive hobby than it is in obviously cities like, you know, Boston, Detroit, Chicago. Um, yeah, there are their there they do have a legion of of fans, especially you know as you get further out into the sort of D they call it the DMV, the DC metro area. But they yeah they could probably move. And then I mean I'd hate to rob the Padres or San Diego because they've already lost the Chargers. Yeah. So you can't move the Padres. But even the Diamondbacks, I mean, shoot, like Phoenix has all the other sports there. Well, I guess they're losing the Coyotes, so we shouldn't lose sight of that. I but. think, I think, I think you keep the Diamondbacks. The only thing I actually did, I don't like the Diamondbacks uniforms because it has the dash, the D backs. Oh yeah, I would much rather. I wish they would switch that up and just go. Well, with they used to have the full Diamondback on the the old the Randy Johnson team yeah. logos. Well, they have to go back to that color scheme too. That's yeah, ten times better than than what they have now. Yeah. Yeah, just looks know, like they look like losers. Honestly, well, we like they that. look like a losing franchise. We're not going to go on a tangent now because I know we're short on time. But like, I looked at the uniform changes the Broncos and the Texans made, and I what I don't understand is why teams are going more and more to this modern, high tech look. They should, if anything, be going back in time. And I think, you know, I personally loved Denver's road uniforms. I think they're they're some of my favorites. The 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 now previous iteration of Denver's road uniforms that they went to in 97. Cause remember they had the kind of the orange crush type unis, more the old school and they would wear the orange at home. And then they went to the blue as their primary home yeah. Jersey. And those, those, that was the first year that was their first Super Bowl, the 97 with Elway. And then they won again in 98. And then in tw- I think 2012, they went to the orange version of that Jersey as their, primary jersey but they still have the blue alternates so i was like okay it's still as a modern but now you're looking in these these uniforms and the jets are another one and we're talking about all the baseball fiasco of uniforms like well the jets actually go back did to the classic back. look what's that they did go back to the classic look those oh, those uniforms jets? are to honor the sack exchange era the jets the new ones i thought the jet oh i i have to look again maybe i wasn't looking at because it because detroit sort of Change theirs. Oh, I see. You're right. It was. You're okay. Maybe I was thinking of something Detroit. Else. I I hate it. I I even they look like the Panthers. They look they look exactly like the Carolina Panthers. Those black uniforms. I was like the like because they also leaked because of guess who fanatics. The those uniforms leaked originally because the fanatics ad got leaked, and I was like, what the fuck are they doing? Like they promised to bring back the black uniforms, black and blue. In my opinion, as a Colts fan who has those black, ugly-ass helmets now, black and blue does not fit in certain instances, especially like that, like, almost Honolulu blue. That It's not quite Honolulu blue. It's not right looking. It just doesn't look right. So I, I hate the Detroit uniforms. I'm The Texans uniforms are growing on me a little bit, just a little bit. The uh, the alternate one was horrible, though. It, it looks like a, a UFL team. <laughs> Like the big H on the side. Yeah, well, I, I just it's too modern and high tech. I like just go back to every jersey the teams wore in like the late nineties. I'd be happy. I was looking <laughs> at the Jets, the the ninety eight Jets, you know, Denver, those uniforms. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. I I like, but in baseball, we said this because you play so many games. They could bust out so many different retros throughout the course oh, of the yeah. year. I don't know why teams don't do that more often. They have those, you know, they'll have games where they honor certain teams and they'll have the Negro Leagues, uh, which is great when they pay tribute to that. But they, I, I, I mean, with with 81 home dates, especially where the teams get to choose the uniforms, I, I presume that's how it works because I know in football, the home team chooses the uniform, but there should be, it should be pitchers. mandated. What's that? The pitcher, the, pit, the starting pitcher normally picks it, from my understanding. Is that both right? Home well, and, and road, yeah. Okay. Well, but I mean, the team could be like, hey, guys, you know, uh, May 13th, we're wearing the 1964, we're honoring 20-year, 50-year anniversary, whatever, uh, you know. And just, it's great. I mean, I love it, and it's there's so much opportunity there that baseball just fails. I mean, then you can make those uniforms and then you can sell them and people will be like, great. We love the 64 throwbacks. Let's wear those four times a year instead of two. And then 
you know, because like I said, when you play the show, I mean, you could choose every game. You could choose like a different uniform combination. Yeah, and it's like it's just fun. It's like yeah, I feel like wearing the city connects. Now I've, today I feel like wearing the old school '30s jerseys. I mean, I don't know. I mean, football it's harder to do that because well, first of all, the 16, league is up seventeen games. That right, you know, so nine, eight or nine home games a year, and then the league has weird rules about it. You know, alternates, but. Even they, you know, I like when like the Bucks break out the creamsicle jerseys or the back in the day when the Chargers had their one or two games a year where they bust out the powder blues before they yeah. changed to that. And it, it was great. I mean, it was good. It, it, it gives it. I'm telling you, it excites people to watch, especially if you're not a fan of those teams. And you're like, oh, I love this. The Chargers. I'm not a Chargers fan, but I'm watching the, the powder blues. I like this. This is visually yeah. stimulating. In 2012, the Red Sox played the Cubs, which was the 100 year anniversary of Fenway Park. They played the Cubs at Fenway and they wore the like literally like the original Boston American uniforms, mm. like all white, plain white jersey. The Cubs wore their original uniforms. It was so horrible. Like it looked so uncomfortable for the players, but equally it was awesome. It was like we're watching baseball from the 1910s. Like this is just fantastic. Um, and then the Mariners obviously turn forward the clock. In the 90s, Ken Griffey Jr., they're, they have to wear that. I think, I want to say they it was in 97. So in three years, they need to bring that back, the turn the forward or turn the clock forward uniforms. Those were awesome. The cutoff sleeves. Ken Griffey Jr. was like instrumental in making those actually, which was very cool. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully, honestly, I, I, hope the, I hope the White Sox get moved. They are, and the Mariners, or the, not the Mariners, the Marlins. I hope the White Sox and the Marlins get moved because it's just, I just, I just don't want to hear about those teams anymore. I just don't. They're, they're, they are so incompetent and they are so boring at the same time. All right. But I guess before we wrap up, what are two things you're going to watch for this week? Well, the, the uh, Guardians play the Braves this weekend. That will be easily the biggest test thus far for the Guardians. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very excited to see who comes out of that and ends April with the best record in baseball. Because the Bra- you know, both of these teams, and and by the way, uh, twenty not well not be it'd be great if this was next year. It'd be the 30 year anniversary of those teams playing in the World Series in '95, which uh, was uh, one of the Indians' missed opportunities and the one of, well one of two World Series for the Braves. Um, but I was going to say that both these teams are in a, have one similar thing in common, both having lost their ace for the season, Strider and Shane Bieber. So I'm very curious to see how that goes. Uh, let me think. The other one? Well, the Orioles are playing the Yankees next week. Uh, so that will be a huge series at Camden Yards. I think we'll get a better sense because it's hard to get a good read on the Yankees. I mean, they – it's like, it feels like they're winning, but they're not that good. You know, yeah. they've been shut out a couple times. And again, they're doing it without Garrett Cole. Um, I want to see if the AL East, I, I would love to see every team in the AL East have a winning record again. I would, it would just give so much more credibility to whoever wins the division too. How about um, you? I'm going to watch, well, the Mariners are sitting atop the AL West right now. That's right. They're playing good ball. Surprisingly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna watch them and then the athletics again. They're I mean they're staying they they've been competitive with the Yankees of all teams. They they won I think Tuesday night and then they lost by one last night. They have another game tonight. I I really want the athletics to just I want them to pull the major league. I want them to win the pennant, <laughs> which would be hilarious. I I want them to win the pennant just to stick it to John Fisher and stick it to to anyone who supported the move to Vegas. But I think I'll pick someone in the National League as well. Uh, there really isn't that much surprises. I guess, I mean, Milwaukee is is one to watch. Um, but the Reds and Pirates, too, those were two teams that kind of expected to do a little more. And they have winning records. Today. I mean, the Pirates came back to Earth. The Red Sox had some of the worst. They trotted out some of the worst lineups I've ever seen against the Pirates, and they swept the Pirates. Yeah, and now they're going to be without Tristan Cassis for a while, which is a, a yeah. another big blow. We've had so many big injuries, um, but you know, you give you give these teams credit too. I mean, especially the Red Sox, right? And especially after all the heat they took for not doing anything in free agency for hanging in, they played really well on the road early on. Um, 
I, again, I just love seeing the central divisions do well. We've been, we've been dumping on them understandably for years. They neither division has sent the team to the world series since both did in 2016. Um, Cubs are playing really well. People don't really talk a lot about the Cubs. They're they're You know, they made some moves this off season. They were good last year. They were maybe like a drop fly ball from getting into the wild card. And yeah. um it's good to see both and Detroit, you know, me and, uh, and your boy were, were hyping them up a few weeks ago when we did our preview show and they're, they're off to a pretty solid start. So let's just see if the central can keep on going. Cause right now I think they're better than both. West, both centrals are playing better than both West divisions. I can tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brian Bayo to the IL. Another, 15, uh, another big injury. Yeah. yeah lat strain. Mm. Oof, man. They just cannot avoid fire the trainer. Like, this is insane. I mean, and the Red Sox are historically, they have very good trainers. They're very, very like, I think like top five in baseball. Normally they usually like, they'll, they'll find a way to win like the best training staff in baseball or something like once every five to 10 years. Right. So, yeah. Not good. Uh, all right. Well, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, share the whole thing. Um, and we will see you on Monday.